Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and uh, what an honor it is to bring in a cat who's from the same generation as some of the most titanic players, especially saxophone players, uh, came up sort of in the uh, post-bop period uh, following uh, bebop um, with um, the likes of you know, Michael Brecker and uh, Dave Liebman and Steve Grossman, except my guest today wound up uh, doing quite a bit of his early shedding up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and eventually has just continued on as a tour de force in modern-day progressive improvisational music. Jerry Berganzi, welcome to The Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to hear to talk to you, man. You know, I did want to just start by asking, I'm a little bit uh, curious, uh, you know, were you aware of the Jewish Mafia saxophone cats in New York? Or were you carving out your own niche in in Lowell? Was there a vibrant jazz scene in, the, in that New England area? Or were you going to New York once in a while to try to sit in with those cats? Well, I, I uh, moved to New York in the end of 1972. Of course, I had met Steve Grossman before because I was friends with Hal Grossman, his brother, trumpet player. Wow. I remember flying down to New York and hanging out with Steve, and we were sitting in different places. And um, But at the end of 72, I moved in with Harvey S. His name was Harvey are you, are you? He, it's his birthday today, by the way. That's insane. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. For, thank you, for <laughs> you moved in with Harvey S., dude. That yes. is sick. Yeah. And, you know, I was playing with... Uh, he got me on all these gigs and we're playing and I was then uh, about a year later I uh, I moved into my own loft on 28th Street well actually it was right on 6th Avenue with Art Barron a trombone player who was on the road with Duke Ellington's band and uh, then I moved around the corner on 28th Street we were playing sessions all day long you know Liebman would be there um, Breaker Bob Berg Bob Mincer, you talk about the Jewish mafia, right? <laughs> the, the, the Jewish but, uh, saxophone mafia, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what I mean. yeah. yeah, the Jewish saxophone mafia. Yeah. I, I never thought of it that way until somebody else. Uh, <laughs> somebody, do, I think, I think uh, the late great Rick Laird told me that that was affectionately that was their name. Um, yeah. But going, <clears throat> I mean, what's interesting is that, like, you know, I mean, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but you were 20 years old in 1967. Um, yes. Did you? I, I just find it fascinating. I mean, it talks about you kind of just burrowing in at getting a degree or in, at, in Mass University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Uh, were there clubs in Vermont, New Hampshire, in the New England area that you that you were able to get your feet wet and sort of just you know get on the bandstand and you know even though you, you were just kind of searching for your sound was I mean I'm fascinated because you didn't. You weren't, I mean, I'm sure you went into Boston to play and stuff, but I'm really curious about the scene in Massachusetts and, and the greater New England area. Yeah, well, you know, I was playing sessions all the time. There wasn't, I wasn't doing a lot of jazz gigs, you know, just, I was playing sessions. I, I was playing sessions with this guy, uh, uh, Tom Marks, who was Zeppo Marks' son. Wow. Abercrombie would be playing a session. Sometimes Gene Perl would be there, uh, but you know, I, it wasn't a big scene. I was playing, you know, every once in a while I have a jazz gig, but mostly sessions. Uh, and then, and I was playing bass gigs. I was playing like uh, I did a, a month with Roy Haynes at the Western Front. Wow! And, uh, wait, wait, I'm on string bass 19... or electric bass? Oh no, this is this is a, I, I played a saxophone with him. Oh, sax. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, with and the Western Front in 1967, I might add. And uh, Carl Schroeder was playing piano for two weeks. Oh, and my. Charlie Bernakis was playing piano. And um, Steve West played trumpet. Hannibal Marvin Peterson, uh, he played trumpet for, for a couple of weeks. But, wow. I, I, you know, um, so I was, but, you know, I was playing with Teddy Saunders all the time. I wasn't living in Lowell. I went to school a little bit. Lowell was like, you know. Yeah, I, I know what Lowell, that's why I was, I was like, how the heck did this, because yeah, I'm like. no, Lowell, yeah. Massachusetts, no, yeah, that's like. Yeah. But I was playing bass gigs behind strippers and comedians, and uh, and then I, I had a gig at the at the Hall Huddy Inn for six nights a week playing electric bass. I started acoustic, but it was messing with my fingers, so I said, man, I'm just going to get electric bass and play it, you know. <laughs> You're right. 
So I saved up enough money and I moved to New York City at the end of 72. And that was, uh, I got a gig with Dave, Dave Brubeck's son's band, which he was on the road with Dave for three years. Then I was three years off. And then I, three years, I, I just played with Dave's quartet. When you, like, uh, part of my show revolves around the four L's, and one of those is uh, is leadership, and I, I just wanted you to talk a little bit, like, just the fact that you came up, I'm not sure if you were an autodidact or not, but, I mean, clearly you guys, all, your entire generation learned to hear music before you learned to read it, uh, and your ears were wide open, and I just wonder, like, you know, whether you got, whenever you got started college or you know you were playing uh whatever it was whether it was uh sessions or strip club gigs i mean was there somebody early on not necessarily one of the titans like roy haynes but was there somebody that you can point to that was really somebody that you can look back and say that they had a profound impact on your own leadership qualities even today <sighs> that's, that's a great question i mean everybody i played with was was uh you know uh, uh, I learned something from all the saxophone players that I played with. You know, I, last last Friday night I played with Liebman. Oh, uh, that's fantastic! And, it's still and, going, yeah. Yeah, still going. And with George Garzon, there was three saxophone players. You know, uh, but you know, I would have my loft on Sixth Avenue. I'm, I'm uh, between Sixth and Seventh. I went West Twenty uh, Eighth Street. I'd, I'd invite one saxophone player and four would show up because somebody <laughs> or five would show up because he would tell somebody else, somebody else that, you know, Joe Lovano would be there, Billy Drews, Steve Slagle, oh, Olmo and this Eric Turkel, just... all these guys would show up. Uh, Liebman, you know, I remember Grossman came by once with Greg, the late Greg Herbert. Oh, Greg uh, Herbert, dude, total unsung hero, man. Dude, yeah. it, was, it was a piano player, I think. I, at least no, he, Greg Hood was a tenor player. He oh. was uh, Mel Lewis and Friends that record with Brecker. Yeah, Freddie like I've Hubbard. seen him on on Pat Martino records. I thought he was playing. I don't know. Maybe he played with. Mo anyway, yeah. that was um. Now the uh, going back though, like in how did you even matriculate into the music scene? I mean, I I, I guess that's you know the idea that you're playing at the Western Front with Roy Haynes at 20 years old. I mean, that wasn't uncommon. I was 19, actually, because I, I, I turned 20 on uh, October 21st, you know. Yeah, that's so. right. So, I mean, like, somebody, uh, you were born, oh, that's beautiful. I, I I mean, somebody was looking out for Berganzi. Somebody hipped you to some gigs. I mean, do you, how did you actually get into the, because here's the thing, I'm 43, and, and like, I am yeah. obsessed with your generation and, this subculture that existed, which is basically a black subculture, is j known as jazz. And I realize you were doing yeah. all types of gigs, but I just don't even know if I'd be hip enough to know that all this cool stuff was going on. Not that I was a musician. So, I mean, how did yeah. you even get, I mean, not that, obviously you were a fan. You were probably just a music fan, but like, was, how did you actually get into the scene? Well, just from word of mouth, uh, I'm playing with, you know, I was playing with Teddy Saunders. I remember playing sessions with Teddy Saunders in Mission Hill, Boston. Now we're talking about and, Theo uh, Saunders, right? The piano player. Theo Saunders, dude. Yeah. He's a. I mean, I haven't spoken to him in years, but he was one of my early. I love what a brilliant. I cannot believe you guys were, were rocking out. That's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah totally. And uh, we were playing sessions at his place, and uh, and somehow that's how I got the call to do with uh, with Roy and. Uh, it, it, it was a connection with Teddy Saunders and the sessions that we would be playing with Doug Senebaldi was playing drums sometimes. Uh, oh, Calvin Hill was playing bass, Ooh, you whoa, know. Wow. And, uh, you know, John Abercrombie uh, would be playing, uh, you know, and diff uh, who oh, there's a great drummer that I used to play with. Uh, Peter Donald. A yeah. Phenomenal drummer, dude. Yeah, and... Uh, so, you know, you're making connections all the time and you just you just want to play. And you said we just, you know, learned how to play by listening to records, playing a lot of records. Because if somebody knew something, something, they sure as hell weren't going to tell you, you know, <laughs> you had to teach yourself. You know, that was the, that's interesting. So you you would say that. Because I th the way I've I've heard, you know, the way it's been explained to me through all these interviews is that 
In fact, it was not overly territorial. People did share knowledge. But you're saying that it was pretty cutthroat as well. I mean, it, there... well, my friends, I know when, like, uh, I'd be shedding with uh, somebody, and I said, what was that? He said, oh, I don't know, man. I see six this came out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, yeah, like, don't. A lot of, a yeah. lot of that. Yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah, no, I dig. Yeah. So, I mean, like, but, like, there was so much stuff going on, like, at that time. Perla. Mark Levine, uh, yes. Don Elias were playing salsa gigs yes. in Boston. Did you play the Combat Zone in Boston? That's where a lot of the strip clubs were in Boston. Yeah, no, the, 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 the strip clubs I was playing, I was playing in Derry, New Hampshire. It was the first. I knew it. Uh, I knew it. I, New, Derry, New Hampshire strip. I need yeah. to hear about these gigs, dude. Well, this gig was at the Shanty in Derry, New Hampshire. So they had, like, you know, strippers and comedians and, and, and sh- entertainers. And I was playing with this. Bill, uh, uh, I know I'm going player. way back here. I know stretching yeah. you out. Yeah, it's fine. So I was playing electric bass. We, you know, we play. Um, Charlie Bernakis was playing pianos. Tony Spitaleri was playing drums. Bill, St- man, I can't, I can't. His name is not coming to me. So um, we play a set of just all um, standards, and then the then the strippers would come up or whatever we. And we play tunes in back of them, you know, the appropriate tunes. And but it was four nights a week, and that was the the first that was the first busloads of people would come up to Derry, New Hampshire, because they they would show porno films in their movie theaters up there. <laughs> this is so freak. I mean, no, but this is listen. That's no different than what Chris Parker, the drummer from Stuff, was doing in yeah. Connecticut, and this is really what I want to you. To, you were you were playing electric bass, so this is a little bit different, but. We're living in this time now, uh, and it's been like that for a minute with uh, just this, you know, where you have human beings playing machine parts now. Like, it's very mechanical. And I don't care if it was David Garibaldi, Jerry Berganzi, Chris Park, whoever it was, uh, the drummers especially, when they were playing these these strip club gigs, they had to hit the dancers' moves, you know? You had to, yeah. you had to hit based on human dancing. And and I just I wonder how much like you were able to sort of not that you didn't have swing before, but how it wasn't a lot of those strippers would be calling out Duke Ellington tunes. I don't even know. I mean, they'd be oh, yeah, you no. know they they had their uh, the tunes that we would play. You know, the ones that would, they could bump and grind and all that stuff. You know, to and, and I mean uh, I mean and it's fair to say that you there were because you would play maybe three or five sets a night. I mean, you'd be playing. Well, but, you know, we didn't play that many sets, but we three sets, you know. But uh, and you, but I mean, at a certain point, you'd be playing milestones, like twenty minutes blown over the top. I mean, that's what a lot of those cats were just. It was just like, oh yeah, it was insane. Yeah. I mean, that to me is so mind boggling that you could go to a a club, see strippers, and then you got these like ridiculous cats blowing, you know, standards, but then just leaving the head of the tune and going out. I mean, that to me is just yeah. classic. Yeah, so, you know, at the time, you don't even think about it. You're you're, you know, just you're making a living. First of all, paying the rent. I used to live in this this at, when I was doing that gig. I used to live in this uh, this apartment in 13 Grove Street, Lowell, Massachusetts. Oh, oh man! And, oh, man. <laughs> and it, it, it was ten dollars a week for rent, and, the, and that's the good news. The bad news: it had no heat. Oh, that and must oh, have been so cold, man! You got well, space I had heaters. A little in- electric heater in my bedroom electric heater in the bathroom a little one and in the kitchen i'd have i'd open up the stove and i had a pay phone in the kitchen don't ask me how it got there it was there when i got there and i had to make so many calls a, a month to keep the pay phone in the kitchen and it had two two bedrooms and i was, but i was the only one living there and uh it, it was so i i had this gig and and one day i came home and there's fire trucks like in front of the house in the apartment it was three, it was like three units on one side and three on the other side. So I was living in the top floor, and the top floor on the other side was on fire. Oh no! That was so out there, man. <laughs> Wait, hold on. But it, but that was somebody else that was trying to keep the house warm, or did they? Did, did your? No, no, I don't know. How, that's a good question. <laughs> the, you know, I, I wasn't sure if you weren't. Yeah, no, because I mean that I had to deal with that when I lived in Austin, Massachusetts. My buddies refused to fill up the oil burner and so yep. like in the winter i mean it was just space heaters everywhere you know it's just unbelievable yep, and you had exactly. the payphone so 10 bucks a week though man I, I mean a good week of 
gigs in Derry and whatnot, you could make your rent in a week. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that it was doable. You know, it's not like rents are at your day, so I forget it. I do want to, you know, at the t- like you said, it's obvious that at the time you have no idea how special a time is when you're sort of living through it uh, musically and or just personally or whatever. But, um, you know, uh, looking back on it, not that you were, you know, loaded with dough, but do you feel like um, you guys, Liebman, uh, you know, the guys that would show up at the loft and even when you moved to New York and stuff like, were you guys able to truly focus on the art of creation and because what's happening a lot today i mean with my peers not necessarily in the jazz uh vernacular but uh you know the cost of living is so crushing and the ability to just sing for your supper is just so much harder uh that cats are really bogged down just trying to pay the bills as opposed to being able to just like go out at night or jam and make music that you want to make that ultimately becomes albums. I feel it, it just, I wonder about the idea of how much that you didn't have to worry about the, the, the cost of living and the amount of money that you, and the fact that you could just focus on the ability to create beautiful music. Yeah. I mean, first of all, when you're that young and I wasn't, married with children i didn't have in other words i didn't have any responsibilities all mm-hmm. i had to was feed myself and pay the rent and the rest and and that was doable totally doable just playing like little gigs or playing uh you know uh i used to play at this place uh in lakewood new jersey richard's lounge sometimes with tom harrell sometimes oh man uh, uh you know, different people. Uh, oh, was that Trump a place? Oh, I can't even think of it now. It's okay. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, but you know, I play a wedding here and there. I, whatever gig came along, if I if they told me, listen, I want you to go in the side, in the corner of the room and play upside, stand, do a headstand and play the side. Well, you know, to pay the rent, <laughs> I'll do it. Cool. You know, I dig. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Jack Walrath was the guy I was thinking of. Brilliant, brilliant, tr- brilliant cat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do like, where do you feel? I mean, how how do you work with? I'm not, you know, with. I know you're at the cons- at least it says you're at the conservatory today. Yes, that's right. And you know, like my my dear friend Rockalam was there for Bob Moses was there for a long time, yes. and I and I have friends that had classes with him, but Lord knows they were not your typical academic classes uh they were no he that's the the he had his own way of teaching and when they lost him they lost something special because uh he he what you got from him was not you couldn't get it out of a book well that's and that's what i want to ask you about because one of my dear friends who's a great drummer on the circuit now mark levy he 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 took lessons or he he was with rocklam and and rocklam would the only assignments he would say is you know Go home and contour this 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 tune, you know, dear old Stockholm with Roy Haynes and Coltrane. Just you know, it wasn't comp it, it was contour it. It was, you know, get the theme, get the essence, but don't don't copy it. Don't, you know, be your, you'll find your own voice. I mean, was there yeah. did, did you were there uh I mean, Mark Levine would go to Jackie Byard's apartment and you know, Jackie was a great drummer too, and a lot of people don't know that. And Mark would sit down at the piano, and uh, Jackie would say, oh, "Let's play Cherokee in all twelve keys." And Mark would fall apart in D or F, and yeah. ja- Jackie would say, "Okay, well now you know what you need to work on. I'll see you next week." It was a ten minute lesson, uh, yeah. you know. And now we're inundated with so much material, and and, and things have. Here's the question for Jerry Berganzi: Do you really? I realize that it it offers salvation and the ability for cats like you know to get a paycheck and to pass the the, the knowledge on but can you truly codify a, the language of blues and jazz in the academy no i mean it, it's uh, it's it's like trying to learn how to to speak a language f- from a book you have to listen to it and get the uh the dialect mm. dialect right. of that music down and it's all feel and uh but Having said that, you can you can talk about that. You can talk about yeah the feel. I like I have a class, and we talk about uh, 
uh, not only, I call it the elements, air, fire, water, and earth. I love it. Earth. I love it. And air is intellect, and the higher uh, aspect of intellect is intuition. Water is emotion. The higher aspect is um, uh, uh uh, what's the word? Uh, why you got to? This is really interesting. We got to get this word. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's it's uh, inspiration. Thank you. I love it. it I love yeah, this. And, and then fire, of course, is is will. It's intention. It's energy. It could be scorched earth energy. Or it could be like uh, hmm. it's cool energy. You know, uh, and earth is groove. It's technique. You need them all, and everybody's got them all. Some some uh, are more. Uh, one aspect might shine more than others, but everybody's got those. Or sometimes it's so somebody might be deficient, but it's all good. Everybody's got their way of doing it. Can you talk a little bit about each one of those? And 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 you know maybe you, you know some people obviously are stronger in in some of those elements than others. Where where were your strengths, and where, and which ones did you have to sort of? dig a little bit deeper. I mean, again, your generation came up and there was no YouTube and there was no, the, the difference is the, it, there's so much visual, there's so much visual material today and so much of it is mediocre. And so you yeah. really are, if you are not a seeker and you're not really, if you don't have those elements and I don't know why most 19 or 20 year olds would have all that together, it's really hard to find authentic burnings. Like I'm a burning person. I don't have a problem with the, uh, I don't even know those. That just was, that was mind blowing to me. Like how did, when did you come up with that element system? I think that's just fantastic. Well, you know, I'm, I'm always been interested in astrology yeah. and, and those are four aspects of astrology and th not only the four elements, but masculine and feminine. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. The divine masculine and feminine within all of us. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes you get some people who are, post cold train and it's all masculine it's all like scorched earth fire 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 oh, you know wow yeah and, and they don't have any female energy which uh cold train had that's why no matter how out he plays it's something that we it, 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 it just takes you in and uh hmm. but hmm. and and you you need them both you do need them but you know so 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 how so so let's get the burgonzi methodology about how to how do you at least help uh, try to pull people's coats to getting a little more female energy into their playing if they are scorched earth, alpha male blowing to yeah, you know exactly. you know how do you how do you get it to balance at least how do you do your best to get them to balance it out? Well, I, I get them to realize what they're doing first of all. So that's it's you know who wants to listen to that like <laughs> like every one tune after another. You know, you try to get them to play a ballad and, and not double time. Or, right. Or, and just get them to chill, you know. Uh, let, and have them listen to people who can really take them in in, in that way. You know, I, I tell people, go listen to Paul Desmond. Go listen to... Uh, Absolutely. You know, listen yeah. to some, some, some uh, vocalists who just do it to you, you know. But listen to Coltrane play ballads. Listen to Wayne, you know, uh, it's, it's not all about scorched earth. Listen to Chet Baker. Well, and it's like, and, and, and that balance was so, re I mean, every album that I listened to, I mean, it's funny because I just got this huge collection of, of uh, cassettes. I, I mean, it's amazing how much, it was just so funny when, they, when LPs were coming out and, you know, the, there were no CDs. So I have all these, like, commercial cassettes of, Wayne and and Miles and 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 Rasan and like you could throw yeah. on a side and yeah there's some fiery uh you know grew uh, you know uh, the stuff the fire element there's some earth yeah. element and then it there's like all this beautiful I mean it's definitely soft feminine energy it's uh, there's these beautiful lilting uh pieces and they sound completely authentic um for you yes, though totally. for you what was the out of those elements which one, which ones came naturally to you, and which ones were stuff that you had to work on? Well, I thought I had to work on all of them. Right, you know? right. But I mean, uh, I can't say that. You know, uh, I definitely have enough fire. You know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, dude. The you the, the 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 Italians, man. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. <laughs> it but, definitely, uh, dude. I mean, that's the other thing. 
Did you know, uh, were you hip to the, the my dear friend, I, and I pray he's doing okay, uh, <clears throat> Don Menza, Sal Nistico. Did you know? Did you know about that Buffalo contingent up there? Or were you? Yeah, I, yeah. I did, but I, 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 they were, they were ahead of me. You know, I, absolutely. Older. That's why I, I know that. Yeah. So I didn't, but I've talked to Don. Don, he's a he's a force, man. I, dude, the amazing. man was, and he's just such a beautiful cat. And the, dude, oh, they, he's amazing. He's amazing. <clears throat> and he, he was, was. I mean, he. Me that, yeah, go ahead. He was telling me he was into opera, you know, and he loves opera. And he was asking me, uh, did I know, related to Carlo Perconzi, who's a... Right, I saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and he's my father's second cousin. No way. So, Holy cow. So it's, it's all related, you know. <laughs> Talking to Jerry Berganzi here on the Jake Feinberg, so such a high honor. Um, you know... <clears throat> I, I, I did an interview with Grossman and, and we had a, it, it went well for a while. And, you know, he, the, the man was just incredible. You know, all those guys were just uh, trying to carve their own path. And I, I just wondered, like, not that you were, that this wasn't your MO, but I always feel like when I talk to Liebman, you know, Rock Alam grew up in the same apartment building as Mingus and all. Max Roach was always over there. And did yeah. you, like, <clears throat> can you just talk about, like, being accepted by the, the, the cat, the black cats in the, in the, in the subculture of jazz? Um, and, and if that was something that, um, ultimately, you know, you had, you know, Liebman was, you know, Grossman, they were playing. Those, you know, Miles had him in the bands. I mean, it, it, I, I just wonder about. Um, and then there were some cats who, you know, <laughs> would show up at slugs. I mean, it would take a lot of balls to get up and and and, and play with some of you know Joe Henderson or you know Elvin yeah. or you know whoever was there. But yet, so many guys. I don't. They may have gone off and done other things with their careers and play in the rock world. But I mean, all of them talked about that if you could play. It didn't matter what color your skin was. You were totally Absolutely. allowed. And I just wanted you to talk about your own evolution. I mean, Roy Haynes hired you for the gig. But when you got to New York specifically, was Slugs still around or the East? Were you seeking these places out to play with cats that were better than you? Well, S Slugs wasn't uh, happening when I was there. I was, I was playing uh, Boomers. Boomers, uh, yeah. Buck, there was a club called Bobbers, right, too? And, uh, Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and and um, yeah, but I, I never went to slugs, and of course with the studio Rivby and all that stuff. That's right, dude. That, that Schofield lived there. I think Lovano lived there too. Probably, yeah. yeah. So, so that was sort of pre Berganzi, New York. Yes. So yep. you would, and then you get to New York, and you would play electric. I mean, you never considered yourself like just a jazz purist. I mean, you were kind of into, you came, it's fair to say you were from the Duke Ellington school, that it's kind of all music. Yeah. I, I, my, when I grew up, my first album, first music I ever listened to on an LP was Lester Young with the Count Basie's band. My <laughs> uncle who lived a, uh, in an apartment building, he was lived one flight up from me and he was played trombone, bass, and, uh, and guitar. So I was listening to Duke Ellington, uh, Count Basie, Lester Young. Then uh, when I was 12 or something like that, I, a friend of mine came over with his trumpet. His father was a trumpet player. I heard Miles with Coltrane and, uh, you know, Sonny Rollins, Art Blakey with Wayne and Lou Morgan, and, and then I was hooked. Wow. And so you were... And would you go to Storyville to see any like any of these cats? Toshiko? No, I'd go to the jazz workshop in Boston. Absolutely. At that time, yes, right. And at that time, I, I could get in. They had a Sunday matinee. Well, they played seven nights a week, and from four to seven, uh, a matinee, and I was studying it with Joe Viola at Berkeley School of Music. Oh, my God. And that's I, insane. I'd, I'd, yeah. so I'd, I'd go in and see Coltrane. I'd go see... Uh, uh, Cannonball, I'd see Art Blakey with, you know, Wayne and Freddie and... and uh, You saw that Wayne band with, with Bobby, stuff. with uh, Cedar or Bobby Tibbins? That's in yeah, that Cedar. Cedar, dude. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I'd see all these people coming in. Rossan, Roland Kirk, uh, Whitten Kelly Trio, uh, 
was with uh, with West Montgomery. I she, uh, you know, everybody played, and that was just something. Probably in 1961, I was going there. I can wait. Hold on for a second. You, so you started going in. I guess you were probably just a teenager. You take the yeah the train into the, Boston. The train in. <laughs> yeah, it was easy. I lived in Watertown, so it was like oh, um, dude, I lived. Yeah, yeah. I've hung out there. I mean, I went to Boston University, so I'm very. Yeah. So you live. So you take a bus or a train over, and then four to seven, and then was there a night uh, Sunday night show too? <laughs> Oh yeah, Sunday night they have Sunday night too. But then uh, you could I could go in at night too when I was 16, 14, 15, whatever. So there's even a picture of me. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody says Is that you, and it, it was. He's listening to culture, and I'm standing up against. I'm sitting up against the wall. Oh my! I mean, if there's anything that you could tell the world uh, in this interview about, to me. Uh, not, I mean, Train studied his ass off. Uh, he was very into the music, but he um, was clearly expressing his own story. And all those guys sort of played their lives. I mean, Wes had eight kids. I think he was a cement mixer by day in Indianapolis. And, and you know, then he'd go out and play ridiculous guitar. But he didn't even really know what he was playing a lot, you know. And, and, and you know, yeah. and, and I just, you know, being that, Everything has gotten in, pushed into the academy now, um, and there's all these curriculums, and there's all these, this all this information, and it's all very intellectual. When in fact, you know, you talk to Perla, I don't care who it is, uh, you know, th this th th we talk go back to the elements here. There's something about telling your own story, and the recognition that it was never about facility and chops. That obviously helped. But it was more about just burning and feel, and I just wonder, like, if you. I completely agree with you. Yeah, uh, and and today it's all, it's like this demonstration of of how well you can play something, comping it with chops, and you know, I, I just I wind up staring at the wall after a while. It just doesn't do anything yeah. for me, you know. Well, everybody today is great from the, from the neck up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's a great line. So how do you try to get them into the what a lot of cats refer to as the primordial gut? How, how is that something that you can even teach, or do they just have to watch Bergonzi burn on the bands? You know, they, they uh, you, you tell them about it, and you keep, you know, saying, yeah, you got to check this out, check that out. But I, I keep remembering that the – they say that the older guys' generation, they didn't care if somebody sounded like somebody else. The, the most important thing to them was whether you had your own voice. So, Well, let's go back I, for a minute. You, you, they, did, they didn't care if they, but if they sounded like somebody else, how did they have their own voice? Right. Yeah. Well, like, for example, young guys, they want to sound like so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. But back in, in the swing era, I heard, uh, uh, this before sure, my turn, sure. that well, somebody was... What they would really respect was originality and your own voice. That was the ultimate. Ultimate. Not whether you could play the shit out of uh, rhythm changes or whatever. It's having your own voice. Where today, it's, you know, everybody wants to sound like the uh, the, the new guys on the block, you know. Uh, they don't necessarily get to their own voice. But eventually, everybody does. It just takes a while. So, um, the other part of it is also like, because people are fixated from the neck up, uh, a lot of time, I mean, the, the most, the greatest music that I love is just that pure conversation where, you know, maybe somebody doesn't take a solo on one tune. There's no real formula to it. Uh, it's I, just, I, agree. I completely agree. Yeah. You know what and, I'm saying? You know, and, and leave the mistakes yeah. in there. They don't try to. Uh, oh, you made a mistake here. Let's let's uh, let's punch in another note. You hear all the the scars, the warts, the the blemishes. It's all in the music. It's 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 real. Absolutely, it is. And and not and beyond that, it's like that to me is like the most authentic stuff. And jazz, I, that word. I mean, I. I, we could walk up and down the streets of Lowell and ask 20 different people what their definition of jazz is and get 20 different answers. So, I mean, I know. <laughs> you know, but it's not this, whatever I'm hearing in modern 
And again, there's so many hungry badasses out there, but the, I guess that's the other thing. The, the music that you were exposed to was like, it, none of these guys were trying to make a hit record. I mean, they, they obviously liked making money, but I mean, Cannonball, these guys were, he did make some hit records actually, but yeah. you know, like it just seemed to me that, um, and a lot of this goes back to the fact that A&R guys were running record companies too, like Riverside with Orrin Keep News, like they let these guys create, they were, they were not doing anything for a, to commercialize it or pop. Later I, that came I along. I completely agree. It was just, this is the music they heard, and let's play it. And then it got marketed, and then cats like you would go into a, a five and dime and buy the, you know, the and there was really, and then you'd buy the rest. So, I mean, they did get some dough for it on top of that. And today, you know, um, I, I just wonder if, what is the most satisfying thing about, a couple questions. One, especially being a horn player, how do you, how do you get your students Aside from talking to them about it, how do you get them so that they, when they leave the academy, they don't sound, they don't co come out sounding like their professors? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You uh, know, like that's one uh, thing. And then oh, the, I um, tell them that they have to believe in themselves. That's oh, I love that. Man. Should, and and they have to listen to themselves and try to extract when they're listening. Think about what what they what it is that they're playing that sounds like them and do more of that. Like, mm. I remember going into a re, re, uh, recording studio every two weeks with with uh, Bruce Gertz and Bob Galati, drummer and bass. And, you know, I'd be playing blah, 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 and, and I'd listen to the play and I said, oh, I can't stand it. But the stuff that just came that just came it, off the cuff naturally. I love it. I love it, man. That I really liked. So I got to accept myself more like that and listening to it. So that's what I need to do more. Just like be casual. I don't have to like burn the house down or whatever. Or, you know, uh, uh, it's it just find your own voice and stick and believe in yourself. And I tell them if there's one thing I, everybody's got something, believe in it, believe in yourself. Because if you don't, Nobody else is going to. You're damn right. Now, can you talk about it? I mean, was it the, the Brubeck gig? Was it? Uh, can you talk about when, beyond the validation from your peers, when you really, when Berganzi be began to truly believe in himself, like what, where it, there was a demarcation point where it was like, okay, I'm, you know, life is full of warts and everything's up and down, but I know that I, when I can just get out of my own way, the stuff that comes through me is me. Yeah, it's you. You just, I, I think it's just playing with with your peers. And, and doing gigs and after a while if you do enough gigs you're not thinking about do I sound good do I sound bad it's like yeah this is this is it this is this is the way I sound you just accept it and uh, I know when I'm on the road for example uh, and, and I'm playing and, and playing night after night after night I'm not thinking did I play good did I I mean it's just this is this is what came out cool just that's that's it. What? And you're you're always trying to uh, refine and develop and refine your art form, but you have to accept what comes out, and that's in in the moment, and that's what trying to just stay in the moment. Was that something that you always? Uh... Was that something that came along when you moved to New York? Did it was it before? I mean, to me, like, and again, this goes into you know just talking to guys like Liebman and Rockalam. I mean, for them, a lot of that there was a lot of substance abuse going on at a certain time, and then they were after a while. It was like, well, I can only get into this in the moment space if I'm, you know, high, or and it wasn't just regulate regulated to them. It was just a very druggy time, you know. And I just when yeah. did, were you able to just trust yourself? Uh, or was there, you know, was it after, like, you know, was there any demarcation point or did it, or like the Brubeck yeah, gig? Or? When, I, when I moved to New York, um, that was the demarcation gig because everything else was uh, prep school. When you, <laughs> when, you're, when you move to New York City and you pay the rent and you're playing with uh, your peers, and of which, you know, we talked about who they were, then... You you're no longer in prep school. You're you're living living the dream. Absolutely. You know? But you That's, were. But uh, I mean, you were. But I mean, even in those 
Because there, I think there was still kind of like that artist enclave down in the West Ville. Uh, Gil yeah. Evans lived down there. I'm not sure if that was where you you were on Sixth Avenue, but um, even in the jam sessions, that was a feeling you got. It didn't necessarily have to be on the bandstand with those guys, right? Exactly. So even the jam, I remember like playing some stuff, and I said, "Man, I don't even know if this is." Huh? And people come, "Man, what was that stuff you were playing?" You know. <laughs> and after a while, you get confirmation from your peers that you know and you'd say yeah okay cool uh you know that sort of thing uh, hmm. it, and, and like you said you're playing music living music breathing music with these people and yeah that's that's the best uh validation you can have on top it does it does help when you i think when you can sing for your supper too. I think that that's the important thing. I mean, if you, yeah. you could be super talented and, um, but I want to read this to you. This is from a drummer. I'm not sure if you ever played with Joe Chambers, the drummer, but he, when I interviewed him, he said, <clears throat> writers and journalists had this term they used called avant-garde. Uh, they were talking about quote unquote free jazz. Stanley Crouch, the writer said that the, Free avant-garde music is what we were doing on Blue Note, not Archie Shep and Albert Ayler. You could hear all the tradition in those Blue Note recordings. We could swing, we could play the blues, we could run through changes. Those cats, Ayler and Shep, uh, were doing, were around doing their thing, but they couldn't play any tunes. They couldn't play any changes. Those cats were playing altissimo. They were squeaking and squawking. They couldn't get a job at Radio City or backing up a singer. Eric Dolphy doesn't belong in that group because Eric was a traditional musician. He knew everything and played in the orchestra. Pharaoh Sanders was playing changes way back then. Even when Train started doing the Altissimo thing, they accepted it because they had heard him play before. All they could, uh, Shep and Ayler and those cats, all they could do is what they did. Shep got better, and as of today, he can play changes. I, you know, and that that came from Joe Chambers, and 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 the more I've dug into it. I mean, the fact is that those guys uh, were in competition with some of those, quote-unquote... My generation knows Albert Ayler and Archie Shep as free jazz musicians, but I, right. wonder, I, I wonder what you thought about it at the time, If you, because they ultimately, those guys were in competition with the Bobby Hutchersons and the Joe Hendersons for gigs. And a lot of those guys yes. were saying, like, hey... We can play the tradition. We can play the blues. We're playing changes. These guys are just squeaking and squawking. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about your from that time, if you felt that they were valid musicians or where you came down on all that. Well, that's that's a, a great uh, what you just said. Yeah, that was uh, Joe Chambers said that. But yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, and for me, growing up in the '60s, everybody was live and well. Ben Webster, live and well. Mm -hmm. Coleman Hawkins, live and well. Joe Henderson, live and well. Archie, uh, uh, all the avant-garde avant guys, live and well. Miles, uh, Wayne, uh, Herbie McCoy. So you're listening to all the, all the scenarios come at you at one time. So I didn't differentiate, this is good, this is, a, this is squeaking and squawking. <laughs> uh, right. You know, so Albert Eiler... I remember when I bought, I think it was Bells. It was only recorded on one side. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was clear and, uh, and with his brother on trumpet. And I thought it was sounded like dogs barking to me. <laughs> and I, but I didn't, I didn't think to myself, well, they can't play changes. I just said, that's what this is. That's, I didn't put it in a, you know, everybody, I think to myself that everybody does what they do as best they can. Some people are meant to play changes like incredible. Some people are meant to squeak and squawk. You know, I think I'd be a squeak and squawk guy, but I, I mean, to me, <laughs> it was like at the time there was, but I mean, also there was so much amazing. All the original cats were still around. Yeah, and so you were, you know, it wasn't like you had to be judgmental because you were just in this, this bathtub of insane melodic improvisation. I mean, it was just, it, it didn't really, and you weren't, you didn't have to be judgmental because there was just so much available. And we were, exactly. you know, I don't know. I mean, I, we were, I would go to a session one day and it was all avant-garde, like completely nuts, squeak and squat. And then I'd go to the next session the next day and they're playing Miles Davis. 
tunes that are, uh, just came out, you know, or from transcriptions. And, I mean, right, right. Nefertiti and, uh, and I'd go to a session the next day and I'd be playing you know, like train tunes. So I, I just wanted to, for me, I'm just, I just love this music. I try to do it all. You, you're, you're what, what uh, Larry Klein, the bass player, would call an omnivore when it comes to music. You know, you're into yeah. it all. Um, do you feel, uh, Jerry, like, um, what is something that you still, do you feel satisfied in the, I, I know Liebman, you know, he, he kind of is conflicted about, you know, teaching and, and cause it's so vastly different the way you were sort of raised and how you're teaching kids in the academy today. But what is something that you still I don't care personally, uh, musically, whatever, like you still want to push yourself out of your comfort zone. I, I just know for me on this journey after 11 years, like it's just very important to continue to pursue the cats like yourself because inevitably I, I it, it, it helps me. Anytime I push myself out of my comfort zone is when I grow. And I, and I know yeah. that that's how you, it's kind of a lifelong thing, especially as a musician. And I was wondering what is something that you still are like, you kind of know you have to keep doing it to push yourself so that you can feel inspired. Yeah, well, you know, I just did a, uh, I just got back from Montreal. I had went up there for one day. Friday, I played with Levin and Garzon, sat uh. there, flew up to Montreal, did a gig at the Upstairs Club with Remy Bulldog. He's a great alto player, and he just wrote these tunes. Man, they just kicked my butt, you know what I mean? <laughs> really like uh, tempo wise they were just br or, 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 no, no not tempo yeah. wise harmonically they, yeah yeah like they you know like nine bar phrases and then you have odd, uh, like a five four bar and this and you know so it's like man you just gotta you know uh, very challenging that's the word so you, you gotta be at the top of the game you can't uh, you know go uh, have you know what I mean you can't Go out the bandstand. You, you have to be t totally straight just to get through this, you know. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, but in that sense, pushing yourself to take just to get the gig and and sort of get yourself into it and stay in the moment, even though there's a stay lot in of the moment. Exactly. that. That's still a, and so after that, it's it, that to, you feel pretty inspired after that. I mean, just be. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just got back from the Czech Republic. I was playing with Lucas Orovec and with a, a great rhythm session. We're playing his tunes and. You know, uh, challenging tunes. So you can't, it's not like just playing standard tunes. They're like harmonically, they go to different places and uh, you just got to be uh, in the top of your game. Jerry, I, you know, <laughs> I work part-time at a nonprofit uh, and we receive a lot of donations from the community uh, a lot of books and records, and and I cannot find. I I found these these one day this collection of fascinating sort of late seventies, early eighties uh, uh, jazz records came in, and two of them were with you. I, for the life of me, I can't find them anywhere on the internet. But it was a trio stuff, and it looked like you were. It was it was stuff that was coming at, out of Berkeley School of Music. Uh, there, do, does this ring a bell to you at all? The, the, this trio well, uh, was it not Fat Records? I, I, it was a private press, and it was it was very interesting. There was like a, a picture of a tree with a lot of roots on it, and and I that was the first time I saw your name, and I and I'm I, and now I'm just freaking out because I cannot find those records online anywhere. I'm just wondering, like, did you? Did you, pro, well, did you make records in the late 70s or early 80s with a trio yes. in Berkeley? And who yes. were those cats? Well, it wasn't from Berkeley, but it was like I, I made records with Bob Galati on drums. That's it. That's what it is. And Bruce Gertz on, on bass. I, so when I saw and, that, I said, dude, the lineage carries on. It carried on. I was born in 78, so when I saw that. So talk a little bit about how that and – then, and then talk about how that came to fruition and ultimately – how you got that to get get pressed and, and put out on because I mean it's burning for that time period. It 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 holds up better today in some ways than it did then. Yeah, well, we you know I was I got off the road with Brubeck in eighty one, and um, 
w decided that uh, t t I was playing these gigs around Boston, and and my move from from New York back to Boston, and when I did, the drinking age was eighteen. So the clubs were always packed, you know? <laughs> and I was playing of like course, four or five yeah. nights a week of jazz gigs in front of people. So it was a different experience. So uh, we but like like, like Pooh's Pub or something? Or what? what, what? Pooh's Pub, yeah. the, sun, the Sunflower, 1369, Michael's. Absolutely. All these clubs around. And we played all these clubs constantly. And uh, Galati, and you, and, and, the, and, the bass and, the, and the bass player. Yes, and uh, well, and I was playing with Mick Goodrick, sometimes Bob Coffin on drums, uh, just great players, and so we decided to record um, the Jeff Williams on drums. Sometimes we we uh, had a record company, it's cooperative, and we uh, put these LPs up. What was the name and, of the uh, of the what was the label's name? Not fat Rick. Not so you that and 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 uh, Bruce Kurtz handled the whole thing, and uh, not fat. Not and, and then where and where were they recorded? Do you do you remember the the studio? Yes. Baker Street Studios in Watertown, Massachusetts. That is see, I knew. Okay, so thank you so. And I think you guys did at least two, at least two. I Rick. think we did like one. Uh, we maybe around five or six. Because when those two, I mean, those those records, I'm still trying to get my ear around. When they came in, that was the first time I'm like, Berganzi, I'm like, this dude is, I mean, I apologize. Well, there, was, yeah. there was one I was supposed to do trio, but the, the drummer got sick, Bob Galati. He had the flu. So we already had the time book, so I played drums on one. Oh, my. I, I, we, we, I, we did all the tunes, drums and bass. Then I opened up the piano. Uh, Bruce played bass, and then I overdubbed him, and then I put the saxophone on top of it. That was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you yeah. go, I, I wanted to ask you about... I'm glad you just dropped his name, because I, I had written it in my notes. Um, you know, he was a guy who was a mentor uh, to guys like Abraham Laboriel, uh, even though Abe wound up playing the electric bass, and you know, you listen to his playing, and it's so singular and individualistic, and, you know, the stuff he did with Gary Burton and Steve Swallow, and I just wanted you to talk about the late, great Mick Goodrich. Yes. Because, you know, that guy yes. never got, he's, it's, one reason I continue on this journey is because it's like, you know, when he passed, I said, and it's not an ego thing, it's just, he was one of the guys I would have loved to have done what I'm doing with you, man. He's, he just was yes. one of the cats, you know? Absolutely. I mean, it, this Nick Goodrick is an expression. He's this is a guy on the inside looking in. Oh damn! You know, oh, I love it. I, the, the inside, inside looking, looking in. And he didn't want to be in front of in the front of the bandstand. He he never took real long solos. He didn't want to. You know, he just he was a twelfth. Well, in astrology, they call it a twelfth house person. Uh, wow. You know, wow. Was it like Waters Neptune Friday. or something? That's like Neptune or so. Yeah, yeah, twelve. Yeah. yeah, actually, Neptune is the natural ruler of the. Dude, you are. An, we got to do a whole session on astronomy with you, man. Yeah, yeah. astrology. Yeah. Astrology. Yeah, sorry, astrology. Please. But uh, yeah, yeah, he was a twelfth house person. Wow. And uh, and yeah, it, it, I can tell you story after story. Tell after me, tell story. me one good one. I'd love, I'd love a good Mick. Well, good. Okay. Well, here's his one. Uh, He's teaching this student a lesson, and the student comes back next week. And he said, oh, did you practice? And he said, no, I, I didn't have time to look. I said, oh, let's go play some pool. So at least play, because Nick was a real good pool player. <laughs> I played pool. They played for about an hour. And they said, okay, I get I got to leave. And uh, he said, but he, he said, oh, thank you, Mick. He said, oh, well, you still owe me for the lesson. Well, you didn't get me one. That was the lesson. We played pool. You didn't practice. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so, but I mean, he was obviously, he just, he, in terms of his, because I mean, he was playing with, his playing was so unique. In, he was, yeah, so man. Unique. And he didn't, and he said what he needed to say in like, you know, a few, bar, he didn't go on endless. Like you said, he kept it, That's but, right. but it was like that he had the elements all together. Absolutely. Yeah. 
amazing. So yeah. wh when, uh, what's, how many gigs, what kind of, are you playing, uh, you ever come to Arizona, by the way? We need you out here to burn Man, a little bit. I haven't been to Arizona in a long time. What what kind of gig? I, I yeah. can't get arrested in this country. I mean, I play. In <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Don't test your luck, dude. Oh, no, no, right. Yeah, no, no. Uh, so you, yeah, no. It's again, it's the same old, same old. The, the 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 cats live here, but their music is consumed elsewhere. Yes, well, right. I have to go to Europe all the time. You know, even after Europe. COVID, that's still the case. Oh yeah, I just got, I did a tour in October. I I was in Finland, uh, Denmark. Sweden, Norway, and Spain. I just, and that, that was for two and a half weeks. Just got, came back in October, and then I just did eight days in in, in uh, the Czech Republic and in Slovakia. I just got back, and I was just in Montreal, and I have to go. I don't have to go to. I'm going to the UK in uh, February now. And and are do you have anything with leave? Anything lined up at the Falcon? Is there any gigs before the end well, of the? Well, I was supposed to do. Lieb was on these, the um, Elvin's 50th anniversary, Live at the Lighthouse. Right. Oh, we my did, gosh. We, I did, in September, we played the Detroit Jazz Festival Lieb, with Lieb. And, uh, Are there recordings of that, be, by the way? I would you, 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 you were playing the, the Grossman role, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nobody can play the Grossman role, but, you know. I, no. No, I, I mean, I, Berganzi yeah. was playing Berganzi. That's all. Yeah. yeah I did. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're playing the 22nd of December, but Lieb can't do it. And uh, Where is it? Where's the gig? Oh, at the New Blue in Manhattan. And, oh, that's beautiful. And so I, I'm yeah. at, I'm, what, you, who's on the gig besides you? Nussbaum, Perla, and not sure yet who the other saxophone player. It might be a piano player. Not sure. Right. He, he asked uh, Levano can't do it. Um Nicole Glover couldn't do Garzone it. or no? Uh, so, yeah, it tied up. So, well, we'll I mean, Jerry, let's. Uh, I'd love to do set two with you, man. We just burned through an hour here, man. But I, it, it's such an honor to connect with you, I, man. Another time would be great. Yeah, let's Jake, do it again, I'm man. Blessed. Yeah, great, man. man. Yeah, be cool. Much love. Okay. All right. Later. Okay. Bye. 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 -bye.